All right, we'll go ahead and get started if that's okay with you, Bill. Yep. All right, well, good after, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Job Searching in, an, in Uncertain Times, which is part of our Get That Job uh, webinar series here at the Champaign Public Library. My name is Jordan Neal, and I am the career librarian here at the library, so thank you all for joining us. Um, so for the latest library uh, news and updates, please visit our website, champagne.org, or you can, of course, follow us on social media if that's an option for you. Uh, you could email us at librarian at champagne.org, or you can chat with us just by visiting the homepage of our website. The library is open and we are still offering our curbside services. So again, please visit our website or give us a call for more information. Uh, moving on to a couple of Zoom features available to you that might help during this webinar. There are some buttons or icons at the bottom of your Zoom screen, depending on your device. On the far left, you have the options that control your sound or your speaker. Moving to the right and within the center of the window um, includes a chat and raised hand option. You can use these options to ask us any questions or share any comments. Our presenter will um, is happy to pause for, for any questions throughout the presentation. Um, we invite you to type your question into the chat or raise your hand and we can unmute you um, if you'd prefer to speak and ask your question. Um, I would also like to remind everyone that our webinars are recorded, so please be mindful when you share your questions and comments. And then finally, I would like to introduce our presenter. Um, we invite you to read his entire biography on our website, but um, William Schrack is sharing with us some valuable experience and insights, especially when it comes to um, his knowledge and training um, in items like career transition and, and job searching. Um, we are so glad that he has joined us today uh, just to share some of those insights. So with that, Bill, I will turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much, Jordan. It's a wonderful day. And welcome to everybody in the uh, in the audience. I'm going to share the screen right now and pull up a set of slides. And if you notice, I did a job search during uncertain times recently and came up with 741 million results in less than half a second. Now, the key to that is there are a lot of people out of work, a lot of people trying to find work, and a lot of people panicking. And what we're gonna do tonight is to share uh, a methodology, a process, a strategy of how to find a job when times are uncertain as they are right now. So one of the key aspects is that job search has crashed, especially for those people 40 and older we do workshops for individuals over 40 called ageism in the job search. And it talks specifically about the types of things that you can do to become successful in finding that next step in your career prior to retirement. Now, during uncertain times, we know that millions of people have been sent home, but we also know that there's a total of 12 million people out of work. One of the things that we've found that with that 12 million that are out of work, we've also lost jobs. And as a result of that, people are finding it much more difficult to find a position and it's lengthening the job search. It's also taken away that opportunity to negotiate, trying to find that sign-on bonus or all the other accoutrements that we used to get as we were trying to find our new job. So this is a quote from Indeed, the largest job board next to LinkedIn, and it is uh, their, their comment of times are changing, it's a new way of doing business, is absolutely true. Those of us that teach and have been on the front lines helping individuals find their next career have found that we are really challenged because the rules are no longer the same. And so what we're trying to do now is understand both sides of the equation. Companies have become remote. They certainly moved that direction to help fight the coronavirus, but now they're trying to figure out their new way of conducting business and who can return, who can't return, when is it going to be safe to return. All these items are being questioned by the human resource departments of major corporations around the world, but they have now also determined that with this change, 
They have to now come up with a new way of onboarding employees, how to keep them engaged, how the social interaction that they, they used to have at, uh, within the, the office confines is now changing and, or has changed and they don't know how to react. So just as we're very frustrated in the job search, so are the, the employers. We found that 42% of the workforce, and this was by the uh, end of tw 2020, 42% of the workforce was working remotely. And 24% that were working on site were those that were the essential workers. But the furloughed or terminated people, uh, that number was 33% and is staying pretty steady. So if you think about it, we only have a small fraction of people, even though people are returning to the work site, to the offices and so forth, we still have a very major portion of the population working from home. Back in March, the, uh, the data was about 11.6 million people were unemployed, but we lost 12 million jobs as companies tried to determine what was going to be their new normal. So that just really, when you look at that, it gives you a, a chilling reality of why it's so, so difficult for us to find a position. It's a simple equation. It's the old supply and demand from economics. And we have a huge supply of individuals right now. In fact, they're telling us that between 250 and 300 applicants for every posting. That coupled with the fact that the demand is, is low exacerbates the situation for those of us that want to get back into the workforce. So for some reason, my mouse is exciting today. Um, my point behind all of this is to set you up on the edge of your seat and say, my goodness, what are we going to do next? And then we can say, it's not all, the hope isn't lost. It's really not a problem because there are things that you can do to help you land 25% faster than individuals that don't have a process and procedure in place. And so it, you will find jobs. And I have a small work group in the Chicagoland area that maintains a database of about 25 executives that are unemployed and searching for jobs. And last year we helped 24 of them land positions. And so it's a rotating group. And if we can help those individuals that are at the top of their career path, and make very large salaries where there are very few jobs, we know we can help the broad general population find positions as well. So the, the HR, uh, the, the uh, um, Society for, uh, it's SHRM is why I'm, I'm, I'm stuttering here. SHRM, the Society for Human Resource Management has said it is a numbers game without a doubt. It's gonna take you about 42 days on average, to land a job for every $10,000 you're trying to replace. So if you're trying to replace a $100,000 salary, it's gonna take you a little over a year on average to land that position. We tell you this so that you don't get discouraged. You must stay focused. You must follow the methodology that's laid out. But when you do that, you know that the light at the end of the tunnel is, is not a train coming back at you, but in fact, that oasis that you've been looking for. Also, it takes about 20 solid interviews for you to get a firm offer. Now, what we found is that people that become discouraged usually become discouraged after they've had eight to 10 good interviews. But Remember this number and just keep pushing because the numbers do work out. One of the issues that we have as we go through this process is we need to understand that there are things that are out there that will slow us down. And if you can recognize them up front, you'll know how to handle it or how to manage it. So let's take a look. First is Losing a position of, for any reason, doesn't matter why, but losing a job is one of the top 10 stressors in your life. Working from home is very, very difficult because it's we are creatures of habit. We're creatures uh, and we're social creatures. So working from home where we're not interacting with our workers, our coworkers, and having to do things different than we would do in an office environment 
does create a fair amount of stress and it slows us down, we lose our focus. Without any kind of accountability, we are also creatures that take the path of least resistance. So sometimes it's easy to kind of get pushed off course because we don't have somebody there watching us. And the fact that when we're out talking right now, trying to find a position, many people don't understand what it means to network purposefully. And we'll talk a little bit about that later in this presentation. And finally, we find people spending way too much time in front of the computer trying to apply for a job. Well, if you look online, we do, uh, uh, we track this on a monthly basis and we find on average, each week, there are about 674,000 jobs on job boards. And so, and those are unique jobs. Well, then because those jobs go to various job boards and sometimes they're rewritten to make it look different, we know that uh, you can go and find a million jobs posted at any given time online. So people think, well, if I do that, I should certainly be able to find a job. And we found that less than one-tenth of 1% 1 of people applying for jobs online actually land a job at or above where they were previous to their layoff. And then finally, neglecting your LinkedIn and social media can absolutely slow you down or bring you to a screeching halt. And we'll talk a little bit about what you need to be doing with LinkedIn and certainly how to manage your other social media in, this, in the job search. Finally, the written plan, uh, being a, if your job is right now to find a job. And so it's a full-time job and you need to have a written position description of what you're going to be doing. And that's what the key is for today. As I said earlier, this is one of your top 10 stressors. So as you go through it, please remember that anytime you have a, a stressor in, in, in your life, physiologically, things are happening inside your body and they are what I call silent killers. There's something called cortisol. Cortisol is one of our main stress hormones in the body. And when you're unemployed, it is so stressful, it, it forces your cortisol level to increase. And that chronic exposure can lead to things such as fatigue. How many of us are ever tired when in, in, in certain cases bored as well? But we will also have an increase in blood pressure. And blood pressure is a silent killer in that you don't necessarily feel the effects of blood pressure as it's breaking down the, the vessels in your system and weakening vessels in the brain. So increased blood pressure is not something to be um, treated lightly. Cortisol also causes weight gain, especially around the waistline. So when you start to see those extra pounds, we laugh and call them the COVID-19, but in fact, it's generally a, a multitude of items causing the, the uh, weight gain. Sleep disturbance, we have a number of people that tell us from time to time that they wake up at 2.30 or three in the morning and then they toss and turn until daylight because the body is so stressed. And then the overall negative mood is something that nobody likes to be around somebody that's crabby, but it's natural to be crabby in this situation. And we will talk about ways to get around that. One of the biggest things for us to do is to accept the fact that our body, our mind is grieving. A loss of a job is the same as losing a, a loved one in our family. So when you do that, you will go through five stages of grief. It's the denial, then acceptance and depression, bargaining and you know, anger. But remember that it's not linear. It doesn't go from denial to anger to depression to bargaining and acceptance and so forth. But instead, it looks like this, this ball of twine over here on the right. And there are triggers, things that set you off. You can be feeling happy and, and euphoric at one moment and something that you see, hear, smell, puts you back into the depressive state or even makes you angry. And you feel as though you're losing your mind. Now, this is a slide from one of my college classes back in 1969, and Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross was uh, writing a book called Death and Dying. And in that research, she was looking at the grief cycle, and she is one of the first to report this 
nonlinear relationship between the five stages of grief. Now, the reason I dig into this so deeply is that we're finding a very unique situation. It, those of you that have children will recognize that dreaded uh, Lego item on the floor. And as you're walking in your bare feet and you step on it, you think you've just been uh, uh, punctured by a, a sword. It hurts. And if you fall, what's the first thing you'll do? The first thing, if you sprain an ankle or hurt your neck or your back or your shoulder, you're going to go in and have it checked. Well, the same thing should occur when you've lost your job. You see, mental health is the bruising of your psyche. You are feeling the effects of the cortisol and the other stressors that occur as a result of this, this situation. So mental health is not just critical for you living well, but it's also critical for your ability to communicate with employers and potential employers and landing that next job. So I encourage you, whether it be Carl or any of the major medical institutions in your area, seek out mental health counseling. And it's not, the, it's not saying you're having a, a, a major problem, but you could be having these internal issues that just simply talking to a trained uh, psychologist could help. And we use the Samaritan Counseling Center in the Chicagoland area. They have five or six centers, but they are, like me, taking clients from all over the country right now because they do telehealth. So please, if you're feeling depressed, if you're feeling lonely and the despair, please talk with somebody. And the reason behind that is we're, we're seeing an, a major increase in suicide, not just with our young people from high school and, and college, but people that have been unemployed. And in here, in the Chicagoland area, we actually, we had a situation where one of our um, human resource directors at a major corporation in the Chicagoland area had orchestrated the layoffs and it, she was so depressed that she took her life. So please don't let that happen. It's, it's, it's worth the, the phone call if something does um, crop up in your life. And if you see something in, in a friend, don't let it just go un, unnoticed. Talk to them and ask them, you're, are, you, are you considering hurting yourself? And if you are, this is the phone number to give them. Now, this is not an easy process. I know we will make it sound easy, but the proven system does work, but it's still, it's a numbers game and it takes at least 30 hours a week of focused, dedicated effort to be able to land that next job and have one that's gonna be worth your while. Everything that we talk about tonight, even though it's being recorded, you can dig deeper, learn more through these three books. This is the basis of the system that we talk about. The first one is by Orville Pearson, and the book is called The Unwritten Rules of the Highly Effective Job Search. This program was, is taken from Lee Heck Harrison, which is the world's largest outplacement firm, and they had asked Orville, what his secret to success was. And he was helping thousands and thousands of people land jobs very, very fast, very quickly as compared to others in their other offices. And so he wrote the process and it has now become his book. The other book to read is the 20 minute networking meeting. The 20 minute networking meeting is written by Dr. Marsha Ballinger. And this talks about developing your brand and then how to communicate it in a, in a succinct methodology so that you can go into a room, captivate a group and not bore them. When somebody asks you or says, tell me about yourself or um, what are you seeking and so forth, you very often will not know where to start and you begin to blabber. It's natural. So this will give you the ability to be very concise to create an elevator speech, learning how to be very, uh, to create intellectual curiosity in the minds of the other people and want that they will want to engage in communication and discussion with you if you do it properly. The other point is to become involved in a job search work team. 
Job search work teams are also called accountability groups. And that's where you align yourself with five to 10 people and you can meet via Zoom or in person or whatever you feel comfortable with. And this book talks about how to set up that accountability group and to help one another get through the, the doldrums of finding that next job. This is really the, the job search work team is the secret sauce. That is what helps open a lot of doors. The proven system is broken down this way. Number one, make sure your home is effective and efficient as a workplace. This one looks like me, I have a cat and um, I need to have an office with a door where my cat will know exactly when he shouldn't be on my lap, knows exactly when to walk across my keyboard, but he's a part of the family. And if you have young children, that's when they seem to want your attention the most is when you're focused on an interview. So you need to have a workspace that's, that has a door and can give you the privacy during work time. Next, you have to have your daily plan. We teach an eight hour workshop on how to develop a daily plan. And it, it is very specific because if you don't have a plan, you won't really know if you've accomplished what you need to accomplish or not. Also, a job search project plan. A job search project plan is very similar to a flight plan for pilots. I'm a commercial pilot, have thousands of hours in the air, yet I will never lift off and go on a trip, even during bright sunny skies, without a written plan. My written flight plan is, it begins with the end in mind. It, it begins with identifying the airport I am going to, and then it develops the road, route that I'm gonna take. It identifies roadblocks or uh, areas that I, I need to, to traverse and, and perhaps uh, uh, request special assistance for. And so once that plan is developed, then I turn it over to my coach. And my coach is called an air traffic controller. In the job search, we do a job search project plan and we turn it over to the business coach. You also must become very proficient at all things virtual. I had um, a class earlier today that the end, there were several individuals that had connectivity issues, had problems with their screen, problems with their cameras. Well, if you're interviewing and you have those, in, those issues, that shows that you lack technology or technological capabilities. And those are so crucial in today's job market, you have already stubbed your toe in the interview process. So all things virtual, you must be working on daily. You need to work on your networking using the virtual uh, platform. You need to be able to interview. And we're going to talk all about this in the next couple of minutes. So at the end of the day, if you don't have a coach, you need to get one. And I'm a coach. I And you don't need to pay for this, by the way. There are nominal fees for some of the, the programs, but I see coaches advertising for $2,500, $4,000. Don't do that. Don't do not get sucked into one of those people. And I've, I've interviewed, I've owned a number of companies and I've interviewed thousands of people and I've hired hundreds and hundreds of people. And I can tell you right now, I've never seen a 250 or a $500 resume. So don't get sucked into that. Find a coach that can help you and, and give you the statistical analysis of where you're going to work and help you understand the process to get there. And then from that, help you build your marketing piece. And that's called a handbill. And then from that handbill, you will then develop your resume. And it's not a resume. You will have a resume uh, skeleton, and then you will add pieces to it or detract pieces as you find jobs you want to interview for. So there is a very definite process that you need to go through and call us. We'd be happy to give you a hand. So let's dissect those items. We're going to look at working from home, developing your plan, search plan, etc. So the first one, working from home, most of us envision this. We think, oh, we'll just sit on our couch, we'll have our laptop in front of us, everything is great. In reality, when I've gone and coached with individuals, this is generally what our workplace looks like. Now, 
there are psychological studies that have been done. Indiana University has done a number of them. I know University of Illinois has, University of Wisconsin has, Marquette, that the, the desk that looks like this creates cognitive dissonance and you do not have an effective, effective or efficient workspace here. So you need to be able to, to clear it off and create something that is, is much easier to maneuver. The fact that you're working from home, it's not, a, it's not normally your office. So you have to share it with your family or, or with your school uh, if you're also taking classes. But the point is, is that we have so many different things working from home that we get distracted very easily. For instance, I, I know that I have people that when I have a two o'clock call with them, that uh, they're blurry eyed and they've just been taking a nap. Well, you couldn't do that at the office, you'd get caught. And that refrigerator or the, or the pantry is right there. So it's easy to grab snacks or it's easy to get on that rabbit hole of getting involved with uh, your social media, uh, doing web searches. These things distract us and take us off the, the focus of our job search. And then finally, working from home, it's easy well, most guys not, but most women, yes, it's easy to see something and then get distracted to do that, that minor chore just to keep the house going. Because as we know, women not just work out of the home, they work in the home and they, they care for uh, significant others and children. So women in the workforce have so many different forces pulling on them. They, they really do need some additional assistance not because, well, they need it because there's not enough time in a day to get everything done. So all I'm asking is that the, the women in the group uh, don't hesitate to offload some of those responsibilities, give it to somebody else to do. It's not a sign of weakness, it's a sign of reality because you will burn out. It's been proven that an organized workspace helps you get your work done faster, more efficiently, but it also allows you to interact with the family and, and have less stress in the home. So let's talk about what this should look like. This is your office. So you need to have a space with proper lighting. It needs a door to be able to shut everybody out. The camera must be not a gaming computer and so forth, but a dedicated computer that you use that has a camera, a monitor, a good keyboard and mouse that you know is reliable so that you can work with it on a daily basis. You also need to have bandwidth. So if you don't have a network with high, high with you know, sufficient bandwidth, a router that can handle it and um, uh, accessibility to connectivity, you're not going to have a very efficient workday. Very often, and what we're doing now, I've done, is I use a voice over internet protocol phone. The UPS is not the delivery truck. It's the uninterrupted power source. The reason for that is we have an opportunity from day to day, in the, especially now in this season, to get thunderstorms rolling through um, Illinois and power drops. And you, want to, you don't want to lose all the work that you've done because the, the computer hadn't saved it yet. But if you have a UPS, it will keep it running long enough for you to be able to save your work. The surge protector is really important so you don't fry everything. I actually had a phone and computer fried during one of our, our major thunderstorms a couple of years ago. We then, while it may sound silly, we, do work, we teach a class on how to set up your office. And we talk about concentric cir circles where you sit is the central, central circle. And that is where most of your work is done. The second circle out is things that you, you access, oh, maybe once or twice during the day. Then the next concentric circle out are items that you may only access once or twice a week. The third circle is items that you may only access once or twice a month. So we set it up and organize your office so that you have easy access to things that you use the most. And we help you set up your files, your, your bookshelves, whatever it might be, uh, and your desk in order to be able to be effective and efficient in your office at home. And then lastly, 
you need to have a good chair and an adequate workspace. I've seen a couple of very, very, very good offices that were set up with a, a door, which were set up on, on two, uh, two drawer uh, filing cabinets and a good ergonomic chair. And it was very effective, very efficient. And people, because of learning to work in that environment, are now saying, we may not want to go back to the office. We are more efficient here than we were back at the office. So setting up your house can be a very enjoyable place to work. Let's talk a little bit about your daily plan. And if you don't know where your plan is or don't know what your, your, uh, your destination is, how will you know whether you've gotten there or not? So the simplest of, of things to do is to understand your body. Listen to that, that, that marvelous uh, machine. You work on a circadian clock. The circadian clock will allow you to wake, awaken at a certain time every day. And naturally, as the light goes down, you'll become tired and you'll be able to go to sleep naturally. So your circadian clock, everybody's is different. You may be more efficient in the afternoon and evening, and I may be more efficient early morning and midday. So figure out what part of the day is best for you, and then start to structure your time around those uh, waking hours. Once you wake up, the first thing you should do every day is to exercise for 30 minutes. You need, it might just be a fast paced walk. You might be going up and down stairs, which I did in the winter when it was unbearably cold. Uh, just walk from the basement to the top floor, or if you're, uh, you know, those, just those stairs, do it for 30 minutes, you'll get winded. But you need that just to get the system going. Then take your shower and get dressed as if you're working at an office. The reason behind that is we know if you get dressed, there's something that happens in your mind. You are now focusing on getting work done. But if you go in just simply in your sweatpants and, and t-shirt every day, you, we've noticed the productivity drops. Then have a great breakfast. Breakfast is, you probably remember your mom and your grandma telling you this, but breakfast is the most important meal of the day. It should be the biggest, the most protein packed meal. You've just come off a 10 or 12 or 16 hour fast. So break your fast, have your meal. Then your second meal of the day, your lunch should be smaller. And then your dinner actually is the smallest meal of the day. And you should try to not eat or snack after uh, you know an hour or so after your dinner. That gives you that period of time for the body to process all the elements that have been entered. And it allows you to process it in a way that doesn't become fat and um, you, you'll stay a little trimmer. Now you go to the office. And the office, as I said earlier, is clean. So when you leave every day, make sure you put files away, clean your desk, and then walk out. Because in the morning when you start and you walk into a clean office, you just feel better. Now plan your work and then work your plan. And I, we're gonna show you that, but we do have this class, it's time management for individuals during job search that talks specifically about the types of things you need to be doing while you're in job search. Now time management, could easily be called self-management. These We've broken this down a little bit. It's more an in-depth discussion of the previous slide, but remember when you are the most productive is when you should be working. It doesn't mean that your time is the same as my time. So don't try to fit a square peg into a round hole. When you're, I have one guy that I coach that does his best work between 10 p.m. and 3 a.m. So I'll send him things, at the end of the day, he'll work on them and send them back to me at two, three in the morning. And I'll get up in the morning and read them and review and make my comments and get ready to help him um, later that afternoon. It works for us. It, it's, it's a good arrangement. But early on in our discussions, I used to say, we'll meet at eight o'clock. We're going to get off to a fresh day because I'm at my desk by 630 in the morning. And he's just getting into REM sleep at 6.30 in the morning. So at eight o'clock, when I was making him show up, it was not comfortable for him. 
Now, again, remember to treat every day like it's a work day. Make sure you get the exercise, the, the proper breakfast, and you treat your home office like your regular office. Now, one of the things that has happened when you get those increased cortisol levels is your mind doesn't slow down. So at night, you may come up with some great ideas and some things that you'd like to remember. But unfortunately, you're not, you don't remember. Instead, you toss and turn trying to remember them. And, and so you'll be able to talk about them or do them in the morning. And then when you do wake up in the morning, you can't remember. So one of the tricks is just put a, a, a small notebook next to your bed with a pencil so that you can scribble whatever great, brilliant thoughts you hear or you, you get at one or two in the morning. And then your mind knows that you'll be able to retrieve it in the morning. And your mind will actually relax and take you closer into the REM sleep cycle. Then when you get up in the morning, you've taken that information, then you go into your daily routine. And then when you get to the office, you take your small notepad, get all the tasks that you want to get done for the day, and now you're going to start to classify them. And they're going to be classified as A activities, B activities, C activities, and D activities. Now, an A activity is one that you absolutely have to get it done today. And if you don't, it could cause all kinds of problems. The B activities are those items that are very important, but they're not urgent. Therefore, they're things that you're doing in preparation. It might be researching the, the target companies that you want to work with. It might be researching the individual that you're going to be interviewing with. And those are not urgent, but they're very important. Then C are items that are, well, they're important, but they're, well, maybe important. We'll put it that way. Um, so if they don't get done today or they don't get done tomorrow, yeah, they, they still need to get done. But they're way down on the list. And then lastly is the D activities. And those are things that you like to do, you, you, you may want to do, but if you don't do them, no impact on your, your job search. So now you've classified all the items on your task list as A, B, C, and D. Now just take a look at A's and B's and do what we call a time estimate. Figure out how much time is needed in order to be able to complete those tasks. And here's the hint. Those A's and B's should not be more than four hours. In fact, in most cases, they may only be three hours. And then take that, that, that task, go to your calendar and actually schedule appointments with you, with yourself, block off the time to do those tasks. So you're building your calendar based on your A tasks and B tasks. And again, three hours is about what it should be. Now, at the end of your day, after you've gone and followed your plan, worked your plan, you want to review it. And not every plan is going to work, but you'll learn as you go along what you can get done and what you can't get done in a daily basis, on a daily basis. So review what happened during the day and take a look at the, the items that are still on your list, transfer them back. And you don't necessarily have to do them tomorrow, but there might be something that's a B activity that you could wait and do on Friday because you want to control your activity. Remember, time management is self-management. So you are in control. You are responsible for what you do during your daylight hours. And so that is what has to be managed. And then once you've reviewed everything and you started your plan for the next day, shut down everything, leave, and don't work into the evening. The reason we say 30 to 35 hours of work on your job search is we've found that more than that is exhausting. And you're more efficient if you do blocks of work and you keep those blocks at or below 35 hours each week. Remember early on when we were talking about not sitting in front of the computer. People think that finding a job means you have to sit and peruse job boards. You have to, uh, look to look at all the different jobs that are on LinkedIn and so forth. But unfortunately, that ha what happens is you, you find those 600,000 postings and you, you find one that looks like it was written for you by your mother. The job description is absolutely perfect for you. You could do it in your sleep. It would not be stressful. You would love it. And you'd even take a decrease in pay just to be able to do the job. 
And then you wait and you wait and you wait. And the reason that you do is because right now with so many people applying for the job, if you haven't properly prepared yourself and to get into network into those companies, you're just one of the masses and your probability of getting a phone call back are slim. So let's talk about the job search itself. The job search, those individuals that have followed this process end up with a, a landing within, you know, much faster than, than those that don't have a plan, 25 to 30% faster. And when, that, when you're following this process, it helps you focus, it helps you know where you're going, who you're gonna to talk to, when you're gonna to talk to them, all the things that are necessary to be relaxed and confident when you go into a job interview. It also provides a clear picture of who you should be talking to and what you're gonna be talking about. And if you have a coach, your plan, your, your flight plan, remember I said, you're gonna take your job search project plan and give it to your coach. When I fly, I, I file my flight plan. I give my flight plan to my coach. Well, my coach is the air traffic controller and they oversee, they watch, they, they follow my progress, just like a good job coach will. So if you don't have a job search project plan, your coach can sit and pontificate give you some helpful hints from Heloise, but unless there's a specific action necessary, a job coach is gonna be just as much in the dark as you are. So that's why a job search plan is so critical. Finally, we found that individuals that have this plan and are working their plan are less fatigued, they have lower cortisol levels, their stress level is low, they're just a lot more fun to be around. So here's how you build your job search project plan. Stephen Covey had the seven habits of highly effective people. Well, habit number three was beginning with the end in mind. So what you're going to do is you're starting with a blank piece of paper, then define what your next role will look like. What do you want it to be? And from there, you have to defend your qualifications for that role. So what job are you looking for? And what experience do you have? What training do you have that qualifies you for that particular role? Then you have to identify what companies employ that type of a person. For instance, when you, let's throw a name or a, a company, or it's, forgive me, let's throw out a position, fraud investigator. Well, a fraud investigator, most people believe that's FBI or local police or whatever. Well, one of my candidates just landed as a fraud investigator for a major medical system. So when he first came to me, he came to me from law enforcement and he didn't realize, he thought the only other place he could go work would be for a credit card company. And when we identified the niche within the healthcare industry, he, he became excited. So we then helped build his target base or target companies of all these medical facilities or medical, the consortiums that would employ somebody like that. You see, once you've made that distinction and you've, you've developed what you want to do, where you want to do it, that plan then is what we use to build your LinkedIn page, your resume, your, your elevator speech or your, your um, brand statement and your handbill, all the items that are necessary for you to get the job. You do not lead in today's world. You do not lead with a resume. You lead with a handbill. You lead with a marketing piece. You're creating curiosity. You, you're making yourself an attractive uh, individual for a, partic a particular position that that company is interviewing for. So everything is emanating from this central point, this hub, which is your job search project plan. The elements of the plan are to understand who you are. So we would encourage you to do your Myers-Briggs, your Strengths Finders. Uh, your DISC, all those psychometrics to understand who you are, how you're wired. 
because you may very well have been shoehorned into a position in the past that's not one that that is uh, meant you're meant to do. Now you did the job, but you weren't happy. And so we want to know what you're going to be able to do, how you're wired and to be happy, and that then find the types of roles that fit your personality. From there, we look at target companies and we break down the target companies by such things as size, geographic location, the culture, all those types of things. Then you write the, the, you, at that point, once you've done one and two, then you're in a position to be able to start writing a handbill, a um, elevator speech. And your resume is actually the last item that you will be writing. Preparing for interactions simply means you must become an expert at how to communicate using Zoom or Microsoft Teams or whatever the companies that you're interviewing with are utilizing. And that preparation also talks about how to be succinct in your descriptor of who you are. Then now you're able to be able to speak and to promote yourself. Who do you promote yourself to? Well, you develop a, a network. Once the network is developed and you've developed contacts, then you're going to learn to nurture it and utilize that network to bring you in because you can very, right now 70% of the positions are being filled, many of them before they're ever posted. So that only happens if you have an active, vibrant network that is promoting you before jobs are ever posted in a company. Once the interview is set up, you wanna be able to prepare for it and understand. And we're gonna talk in a few minutes about some of the questions that you're gonna see now during the, uh, this uncertain time. The types of questions that are being asked now are far different than the ones that were being asked a year and a half ago. You'll also wanna line up your references. And this means not just asking somebody to be a reference for you, but preparing them, teaching them what to say, how to say it, and the types of responses to these tricky questions that will be asked by the potentially high, a potential hiring manager. Interviews and follow-ups are, and I say attend interviews and follow-ups, the problem is that people, if you're late for a virtual interview, you couldn't get your computer started or your screen didn't come on or your camera wasn't connected. That's the same thing as being late for an inter interview. And that in the minds of the interviewer is that you may be late for work. And so being prompt and being effective in your interview is crucial. And then following up without being a nuisance is, is very, very important. The book, the highly uh, effective job search, we'll talk about how to do that. And then lastly, although we don't have an awful lot of negotiating power right now because of the market, you do know that you don't always say, yes, I'll take the job when it's offered to you. Say, I need to think about it. Give me overnight and I'll be back to you first thing in the morning. So you have time to look at and evaluate what the offer is and then go back and look at all the other elements of the company and the, cult, the culture and location and everything to determine whether or not you think it's going to be a good fit. So without a plan is the same thing as going to the, to the uh, shooting range and putting a blindfold on because you won't know where the target is. So if you don't know where you're looking or where you're going, you could be putting all this energy in but going in the wrong direction. It sounds silly, but it does. I, it happens. I see it every day. So let's get good at all your all the different elements, like networking and interviewing. So if you don't know how to use LinkedIn, get your profile up and then start using the LinkedIn training videos. That's LinkedIn gives all these free videos on how to use the platform efficiently for finding a job. 163 million, it's actually more than that now, but 163 million users in the United States use LinkedIn. And the recruiters use it to find 
what they believe will be qualified candidates. So if 87% of recruiters are using LinkedIn, it makes sense that you should be in, on the LinkedIn platform and you should be doing it efficiently. As I said earlier, you don't lead with a resume. LinkedIn is no longer your online resume. It is your marketing piece. Your goal is to make yourself look relevant to hiring managers, especially older employees or, or unemployed people who are a little older. You must look relevant in order to be seen. And there are things that you can do working on your LinkedIn uh, page every day, 15 to 30 minutes, that make you relevant in the eyes of their algorithm. And you can learn how to do that on LinkedIn. The videos are very easy to watch and very informative. Now, when you build your LinkedIn, one of the key facets is to have a profile picture. If you don't, we've found that you're being passed over. By just having that photo, the statistics most recently show a 14 time more, uh, the likelihood is more of being viewed by having a, if you have a picture than if you don't. Then the background picture shouldn't be something about um, your hobby or whatever it is. It should be about your brand. In, in my case, if you go to my LinkedIn page, um, you'll see the background. You want your, uh, my background, which talks about being an executive recruiter, being a coach, being an, a trainer, a teacher, et cetera. Uh, the headline, which is that, that bold piece underneath your, your photo is really important because that's where you can put in keywords that will be picked up by recruiters and other individuals that are doing a search for a particular profile. This is my link. My LinkedIn is linkedin.com slash in and then slash William Schrag. You can customize it to anything you want, but the most easily found is just simply your name and you can customize it. Make sure you look at your LinkedIn page and there's a small blue highlighted area that says contact info and you fill out that in, you do the editing, put your email address in, put a phone number and other important links because if people can't find you, this is a numbers game. They're not going to waste the time trying to track you down. They're going to go on to the next candidate who's equally as qualified and easier to reach. Now, your when you put your phone number down, it does not, it is not accessible to anybody that's not your first level contact. So it's not a safety concern. You're going to connect with ind individuals that you will know or you will know who they work for, etc. So once you've connected and become a first level connection, then your phone, phone number and email address becomes accessible to them. There's something that I affectionately call the uh, horse collar or the, the Christmas wreath that says open to work, open to network, open to whatever you call it. You can set that up. It's sometimes when you click on open to work, this thing will automatically appear around your picture. Now you can take it off if you want, but it is something that does make you more relevant when somebody is searching for people that are unemployed. Always personalize your connection request. So when you're looking at trying to connect with somebody, make sure that you do a little bit of background on them and your note to them will be uh, using their name. So dear Sarah, I was searching LinkedIn and your profile came up. I noticed that we have some common connections and I'd be honored if you if we could join professional networks and then your name and number. And that very often will be accepted versus the, the generic request that LinkedIn puts up. Once your pro profile is complete, make sure that you engage with people that you are at the target companies or places that you would like to be engaged or want to work. So use this platform to get into the companies where you'd like to be and then build meaningful relationships. And that just isn't sending them a note saying, hey, do you have any jobs in your company? But actually trying to develop 
a, a two-way discussion. And remember, you're asking them for help and you need to give them just as much assistance as well. I said earlier in the presentation that most jobs, and it's almost 70%, are never posted. And over 80% are found through networking. So LinkedIn is a very important platform for you to become uh, very engaged in. So here is a couple of different strategies. I say keep it to si very simple to 30 minutes every day. And what you're going to do is you're going to identify at least 10 people that are important to you. Okay, so let's say you have 500 contacts right now. Every day, pick out 10 people in your contact list. It could be simple as printing out your contact list and then every day checking off 10 of them. Go to them, find their email address, which is under the contact information, and move and try to send a just short, sweet email. Hi, I was looking through my LinkedIn connections. It came on your name. I realized we haven't been in touch in a while. I hope everything is well. I've been furloughed due to the pandemic, so I'm in job search. Do you have time for a quick call to reconnect? You're not saying I need a job, but you're telling them that you're unemployed. And as a result, they may very well pick up the phone and call you. In fact, I've found many situations where that's what happens. Next, you want to link into target companies. So every day, pick two target companies that you want to work for. Again, this is a numbers game. Just because you're doing 10 in a week doesn't mean you're going to get connections in all 10 companies, but two every day. And first, you're going to look for anybody that is already at that company that you're linked into because people are moving all over the place. And if you haven't stayed in contact with somebody, it's possible they've moved to a new company without your knowledge. So search, find out if there's anybody at your target company that's already a connection to you. It's either a first or a second and reach out to at least two of them every day. If you don't know anybody in that target company, then you'll seek out, there's through um, Sales Navigator, which is a, an add-on to LinkedIn, you can find out names of individuals at your, your skill set level or your job level and get names and, and titles, and then send out at least two every day requests to connect. So you'll be saying, I was looking through my LinkedIn connections, your name came up, I realized that I work at um, so-and-so just like you, and that's a segment of, of a job segment that you're working on. I'd be honored to add you to my professional connection so we can collaborate. Kind regards and sign your name, put your phone number in, underneath it. That is not asking for them to be a connection as much as it is, would you be willing to collaborate? And very often people will say yes to that. And again, notice that you're not saying I'm looking for a job. You're saying I have a skill set similar to yours. Let's talk. Let's talk about the interview process. Oh my goodness, things that happen during the interview process. You would absolutely, you would. would it, this should be on uh, public or on television, like the the funniest things kids say. Well, watching people get started in a virtual environment for an interview is quite comical. First thing you do, set your camera at eye level so that it's easy for you, like a uh, television announcer, to be looking as if you're looking right in their eyes. Next, always set it to speaker view so that when the individual is talking to you, they fill up the entire screen. Then, as you see in my background, I have blurred my background. And you can do that. That's a virtual setting on Zoom, or you just have a plain wall. You don't necessarily want it to be your bookcase or all the things that have knickknacks on them. You want to keep it as, as plain as possible. And you dress for connect, uh, dress for success. I say don't dress just from the waist up, even though it's probably what we all do, but you want to be able to um, look at how you come across. And I, I once I started teaching this, I became quite uh, interested in what the newscasters were wearing. And I noticed a trend because colors look unique on the video. So please test it, find what looks best with your complexion 
and your background so that you come across professional. Sit upright, put a pillow or a rolled up towel behind the small of your back so that you're, you're not hunching over and make sure your door is closed and avoid any distraction. Practice, practice, practice. I say practice, perfect practice makes perfect results. So work and record, practice and record most of the questions that you think that you're gonna receive and work with a coach, somebody on the other end where you can practice and get live feedback. Listen to your voice inflection, watch for your eye movements. Don't use hand gestures like me. I, I talk with my hands. I've been a teacher for 40, almost, yeah, 40 plus years. And I do, because early in my career, I'd use the, the whiteboards and, and uh, animation is important in the classroom. But when you do it in a uh, virtual se session, it can be annoying. Please don't eat or drink while you're being interviewed. I had a fellow actually bite into an apple and then chew it like a horse during an interview. Uh, it wasn't very effective for him. He didn't get a call back, but he didn't realize until afterwards and we brought it to his attention, it never crossed his mind. Understand what you're going to say and what you should be talking about is not you, it should be them. You under, need to understand the, the pain points or what the needs are of a company. And then as you speak about yourself, you're talking up and connecting your skill set and competency to the pain points that that company has. And so you're showing that you can alleviate their problem because you're being hired to fix something. You're being hired to do something that's going to put money in their bank be able to be to understand their company and to communicate it talk about how well you uh, you bring an energy level how, how your stability of working five seven ten years at a company all that's very uncommon these days but talk about the fact that you enjoy connecting with teams and being part of a team and you your job is to be the most effective member of that team possible Give examples of what you've done to lead teams or to be a, uh, an active participant in a team. And active listening means that you're not jumping to answer a question. Active listening is asking a question. So somebody asks you something, ask them something in return. And it's a, you're trying to develop a dialogue here, not just give an answer. Here are a couple of new interview questions that we've seen recently. So working from home, and we talked about time management being self-management, the question of how have you been managing yourself during this period of, of working from home and how have you been staying proactive? And what they're looking for is what your, your level of intellectual curiosity is and how you go outside of the box to be effective in your job. Can you or have you worked remotely? And you'll say, obviously, I have been. And give, be able to give examples of the types of projects that you've worked on and how effective you have been. I wouldn't necessarily say that you're so effective that you don't want to go back to the workplace, but that question will come up without a doubt. How do you organize your day when you're working from home? Well, I just gave you that answer of how to build your daily work plan. And companies and hiring managers are real, real, really focused on this because they don't have the ability to drop into your office or to see you in the workplace. So they want to know how you set up your day so they have a, a comfort level of what you'll be doing if you were to be hired. And as I said earlier, will you be working or will you be okay returning to a physical office when it's safe? And so think through that and be able to give a good, concise answer. And then they want to know how well you interact with team members, even though you're all working remotely. 
So do you have Zoom calls? Do you have phone calls? Do you text? Do you, and texting seems to be very effective in getting short snippets of communication and getting things done. So look at all the different methods that you use as you communicate with teammates. Have you been, uh, how have you been managing yourself uh, in, in, in the, this time is, you know, the key of being able to um, be proactive, being ahead of the game is so important because working from home, we take the path of least resistance. And what HR people are telling us is they're trying to figure out, because it's a gamble, when they hire you, it's a 50-50 chance that you'll succeed. So they want to know as much about how you act on your own and how you may potentially act as one of their employees. So they wanna see if you're flexible. There's actually a flex test to determine how well you can go from task to task and respond to the whatever the most important task is at hand. So you need to be able to explain all of that. And if you lost your job, you know, what did you do? to begin your search. What was it that helped you pick up the pieces and start running quickly? So we've, we've gone through how to work remotely. Uh, remember, if you've never worked remotely before, but you have now, really talk a lot about being able to work, like right now, I just we have a guy that we assisted in, in his search and he's working from, with a company in London because he can do so via Zoom. His, so he works a whole different schedule living in Chicago. But the point being that he never did that before and he was able to communicate his skill set to his hiring manager and said, I can do it. It doesn't matter where I am. And you're going to save a lot of money by allowing me to work from here. And then I'll come into the office once a quarter or once a month, whatever's important for you. All right. All of this stuff is so simplistic that you want to plan it out because I say it's so simplistic because it seems natural for us to be able to talk about how we plan our day and so forth. But don't wing it. Think through these questions and write out your answers and then practice them. We're going to blast through these fairly quickly. All right. You have to be engaged in your discussion with the employer. So one of the questions you can ask is how the COVID, how the impact of COVID has affected the team and the company. And compared to other teams, was yours more or less impacted by the COVID changes? What you're looking for here is how to, you wanna know what their pain point is and, and find out what has happened by not, them not being able to be in the office. With tough economic times, why did you decide to fill this position instead of some of the other roles in the company where you could have, could have been hiring? So you want to see what it is about the job that you're applying for. Why is it so important? And then you can answer with what your competencies are and how you'll be able to, to meet the needs of the company. Another question that was, I found very interesting is somebody, we, because I actually hired somebody at our career center and they asked me, they said, how are we going to be successful in 2021? What's it going to take? What will it look like? And how does this position I'm interviewing for help you to achieve those goals? Very, very good question. And it, that actually led to that individual being hired. If there is a return to the office plan, what is it? And if you ask them and they don't know, then just say, well, I'm comfortable working remotely. But once we know what the return to work plan is, let's talk about it. So, um, you know, has the company uh, changed their view on remote workers or has this made it easier or less, less easy for the managers? Get them to talk about, because remember, companies don't know what the new normal really is and you want them to talk about it and show your empathy for what they're going through. Earlier in the presentation, I said it's important to find an experienced career coach. And there are a bunch of them out there. 
And unfortunately, some of them are fleecing the, the public. So a good career coach has been through this. A good career coach has been through the hiring process. A good career coach has hired and has managed and has uh, been out there with those difficult discussions with employees. So a good career coach is well-rounded and their, their expertise will give you, it's like playing cards while looking over the shoulder of your opponent. You, you know, you'll be given all that inside information. And what it's gonna do is it will shorten your career search because it, you aren't gonna be making all those same mistakes that, that uh, other people are making on their own. But to find a good career coach, you want to ask these questions. What's their employment history? Were they hiring? Were they a manager? How did they handle all those difficult actions like firing people? How long have they been coaching? How many people have they helped to successfully land? And I can tell you my group of my coaches, collectively, we've assisted over 9,000 individuals. And all of our coaches are, are volunteers. And we've all had, um, when I bring a coach on, I interview them for a non-paying position. And I don't bring everybody on. Uh, they need to have pertinent experience, but they also have to have empathy and a desire. They have to have honesty, integrity, and willingness to help those in job search. And what's their scope? because many people will focus just on IT. Some work just on HR, others work just on manufacturing. So find out if they are a good match for you. And then is there a cost? There are many very talented coaches that are available to you for $250 or less, and that's for the entire package, not $250 an hour. Now, I will confess, I do have a couple of, co of clients that do pay me $250 an hour, and they're getting a bargain because all, that they, all the work they need to help them reshape and get back out into the workforce. But those are specific executives that need one-on-one -on -one coaching, and they take up a fair amount of time. And so I do get compensated for that. But it's very, one of my, one of my candidates was actually Bill Marriott Jr. So if you're in that level, you probably will get charged. But if you're not, it's, it's all pro bono. The things that we tell everybody is that most jobs aren't posted. You have to be good at networking. Many companies now give a bonus to bring people in, to attract new employees. Now, I can go into a company looking for a job and I can apply through their job postings and then somebody equally qualified goes in as a recommended uh, candidate from somebody that's an, a trusted employee and they show up at HR at the same time I do. I can tell you that the person that was referred by a trusted employee will always win unless I am absolutely superior, but I said equally qualified, the person that's walked in to HR or to the hiring manager will always take top position. I'm also an executive recruiter. I, I do very, very specific types of searches. So companies come to me on a retained basis. And when I get unsolicited resumes, I rarely spend more than five or six seconds on it. So it has to be eye-catching and it's got to be relevant to what I'm working on at the time. A lot of situations when I have to reply to somebody, if they don't have a professional looking email address, it, that piques my interest. For instance, I had a young person call, well, his email was freakyfreddy at hotmail.com. Just saying it made me curious. So I did a little more background check and he was freaky on the weekends. Uh, and even though he seemed to be qualified in a particular, very niche oriented position, I decided not to go with him. And I found out that almost 60% of the resumes that are rejected are rejected because they don't, the, the email address just doesn't look 
relevant. 67% of all online applications never get seen by HR because of the uh, applicant tracking system it, it has filters. So when I say that one tenth of 1% of the people get through, it's not because the individuals aren't qualified, they just don't know how to get through the software. And there are classes that can teach you how to get through that. And I said earlier, 42 days for every $10,000 that you're trying to replace, then that sets a realistic expectation for you. Also, two independent candidates coming into me, if they're qualified, I am definitely going to start look. I go to their LinkedIn page. 98% of my colleagues do the same thing, but 60% dig deeper and go down and look at their face at an applicant's Facebook page. And 40% may actually go into the Twitter account. And then from there, we will make our decision of whether or not the individual would be a good fit for the company. A litmus, litmus test for everybody is, as you're looking at yourself on your Zoom, would you hire yourself? If you were to interview you right now, would you hire yourself? And if not, why not? Write that down, work with a coach, and the coach can help you get through it. Because if you were to say, oh, sure, I'd hire me, you're not being truthful. You know there's something in your background, there's something in your, your, your training, et cetera, that could potentially stop you from getting a job. So when people come to me as a coach and say, I just can't find a job, I ask this question, and more than three quarters of the time, when the person is honest, we've identified one of their roadblocks, we begin to work on it, and their hiring freeze seems to, the, the, the blockage seems to be removed and they uh, get hired. So very important for you to understand who you are. There are a lot of ways to control your de destiny and get to where you need to be. I, this fork in the road, you can retire, you can keep searching for a job or you can do a side hustle or actually get out and, and buy a business. And with the years and years of experience, if you've been running companies, running divisions of companies, um, you've been a manager, you have the skill set to do your own gig. And before you get uh, into one of those situations, talk to a coach. I do uh, a lot of business coaching and be happy to talk to you and make sure that you don't get fleeced. So if, if that's a possibility, Give us a holler and I'll be more than happy to walk you through the process. So here are your goals in finding your job. Your job is a full-time job. So make sure that you set up your office properly and you have a door and that you set up your office hours so you're not interrupted and you focus on specific efforts. Find a coach somebody that can help you get through the job search program, helps you create the, your job search project plan, and then helps you put it in place and find and attend workshops like this one. And by the way, our group, uh, I'm the executive director of the Barrington Career Center. Uh, our name will soon change. It's gonna be called Career Place because we have um, job seekers who are members of our program from all over the United States now. And we have a series of 18 different workshops like this, where we assist individuals in enhancing their skill set so that they're better candidates in the work process or in the job search process. I said earlier that book Team Up talks about how to build a job search work team, and you can create one. There are many of them around the state that I can help you align with. And these become your accountability partners and make sure that you stay on track. Practice, practice, practice. Get good at all the virtual networking opportunities that are out there. Practice your interviewing skills because it's not natural to do what we're doing the way we're doing it right now. So it's a new acquired skill. Weekly, I would like very much for you to, to not work more than 35 hours, but focus on at least 30 hour job search, set up a daily weekly plan to give you that. Spend 30 minutes a day working on LinkedIn. 
keep at least 10 target companies in your pipeline at all times. And remember, you're gonna try and bring two new connections through that every single day. So in a week, you're gonna have 10 decision makers that you've connected with uh, at, uh, on LinkedIn. And then keep track of what you've done every day. So at the end of every day, turn your computer off, turn your phone off and sit down and review what you did. Find one or two really good items that occurred for you that day. It might be finding a new connection or having connected with somebody that's gonna help your search. It could be having a, an interview that went well. But at the end of a month, you have at least 20 items that you've, you've put in your journal of good things that have happened to you. Finding a job is difficult. In fact, it's terrible. And it's easy to get demoralized. But if you keep a journal and look at the good things, you will then remember the numbers, the how many, 42 days for every 10,000 in salary and the 20 interviews, and it will keep you energized so that you can get through the day unscathed. As I said, we've assisted over 9,500 people since 1996. We are right now the Barrington Career Center. We used to be called Career Place and now we're going back to it. You can find us at the Barrington careercenter.org. It's a long name, but it's all these words, the Barrington Career Center.org. Go to our website and take a look at all the things that we offer. We give you the one-on-one -on -one coaching, we do assessments, we do workshops, and we help you in the networking process. In our one-on-one -on -one coaching, as I said earlier, the all of the coaches that I have are executives that have retired from international or national organizations. And they can help you put together your plan. The workshops, we're doing them virtually right now, but in middle of June, we're actually going to be doing in-person and we will have a road show. So it's quite possible we'll be coming to your library in, in Champaign-Urbana. So keep an eye open because we may be there, but the workshops we do start off with helping you set up your navigation. Then we do your assessment. we help you with your job search career plan. Make sure your handbills and your elevator speech and resumes are all up to stuff. Then we help you with three specific levels, beginner, intermediate, and advanced LinkedIn. And we work one-on-one -on -one doing mock interviews. We do time management and organizational skills. And then we help you understand what it's like to be successful with a, a getting through to a specific company. We've figured out how to crack the code on these ta talent acquisition software packages that companies have been using. And then we also, I, one that I did earlier today was a workshop in Chicago, helping individuals over age 47 because that is when ageism starts to take effect in the job search. So we have a, a, a bunch of really strong hints and tips on how to make yourself more attractive in the workplace when the individual that's hiring you or interv inter interviewing you is 25 years younger than you. All right, we also have these virtual networking programs that we can align you with. One's for executives, then we have the Chicagoland uh, Executive Networking Group, and we have small subsets in five communities around the state, all the way down to uh, almost to St. Louis. And then we have job search work teams that you can participate in. This is me, and a much younger me, but uh, my background, as you heard earlier, and the bio is up on the website, but um, I've been doing coaching and career uh, uh, coaching and transition work for a number of years now. And my basis has been my corporate base uh, training from Bristol Myers Squibb and working with Dr. Stephen Covey at his leadership center in Utah and the Co Franklin Covey training program. My phone number is the 847-304-9519. That is my direct line, or you reach me at william.schrack at gmail.com. And ladies and gentlemen, that is our program. If you have questions, I would be honored to take your calls. 
and to uh, spend some time with you, helping you in your career search. And sure enough, that is our program for the day. Well, Bill, thank you. That was great. Thank you for your time. We really appreciate it. Um, if you, didn't, if you didn't catch uh, Bill's contact information, here is my contact information. You can reach out to me directly and I'll connect you with um, Bill. So I don't see any questions right now. Um, and once again, this will be available through our YouTube channel as well. Um, yeah, so Bill, not to take away from you again, that was a wonderful presentation. Um, but our next career webinar will be um, Wednesday, June 2nd at 2 p.m., which will be Transfer Your Skills. We'll be hosting um, Kevin Martledge of Next Year Advisors, who is a local career coach, and he'll discuss those transferable skills such as um, communication, critical thinking, teamwork, leadership, things like that, and how they could be applied um, professionally regardless of your job or your field or your industry. Um, and then we have the upcoming um, webinars here, career webinars here in June, but we have a lot more webinars related to our business series and our technology series and our crafty adults and writers workshops. So you can visit champagne.org slash events um, to find more information on those and to sign up for those webinars. And then, um, as I mentioned before, for any library news or updates, please visit our website, champagne.org, um, for more information. Or you could chat with us, again, just by visiting the homepage of our website. Or you could email us at librarian at champagne.org. And I don't see any questions. <laughs> So once again, Bill, thank you. That was great. We will be hosting Bill again next month um, and he'll be discussing, um, it'll be on Tuesday, I think June 22nd at 7 p.m. And uh, he'll be discussing uh, exploring options when your job uh, searching stalls. So we're excited to welcome you back. Do you have anything else to add, Bill? That is it. And thank you so much for the opportunity. It was a pleasure to meet you. And I, I do look forward for the opportunity to bring the roadshow to champagne yes yes we look forward <laughs> to it all right well take care everyone i hope everyone has a good night bye-bye good night mm -hmm.